Good afternoon and welcome to our cardiac and vas vascular lecture series. I am Dr. Rogelio Uribas, Corporate Vice President of Baptist Health International, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this informative presentation. I would like to extend warm greetings to our friends across Latin America, the Caribbean, and everyone joining us today. During this interactive presentation, you will have the ability to ask questions via the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. I will be your moderator in today's lecture. This afternoon, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Sergio Darabant, who will be presenting a lecture titled Advancements in Preventive Cardiovascular Medicine. Dr. Darabant is a medical cardiologist at Baptist Health Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute. He is board certified in internal medicine and nuclear cardiology. Dr. Darabant specializes in the prevention diagnosis and treatment of coronary artery disease, valvular heart disease, arrhythmias, and cardiomyopathies. He is, also has extensive experience in cardiovascular imaging, intensive care cardiology, and advanced heart failure therapies. Dr. Daraban received his medical degree from the Lulu Hariganu University of Medicine and Pharmacy in Romania. He completed his residency in internal medicine at the University of New Mexico Health Science Center in Albuquerque, and followed by a cardiovascular disease fellowship at the University of Louisville Department of Cardiovascular Medicine in Kentucky, where he served as chief fellow and was under the mentorship of Dr. Marcus Stoddard, the president of the National Board of Echocardiography. During his fellowship, he developed a special interest and training in transthoracic and transesophageal echocardiography imaging. These techniques are used in evaluating cardiovascular disease and stroke patients. They're used as a pre-procedural evaluation of valvular heart disease, preparation for structural heart disease interventions, and for medical guidance to prevent recurring stroke. His research has been published in peer-reviewed journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of Heart Valve Disease, the Journal of Hospital Medicine, and the ACC FIT online. Dr. Darabant was also elected as an American College of Cardiology Fellow in Training and Editorial Fellow. Please, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Darabant. Dr. Darabant, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for that um, very warm welcome. It is my pleasure to be here with you today. And um, I want to thank everybody. Uh, outside of the United States and within the United States for joining us today. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be here with us. Um, uh, it is a great honor to speak uh, for you today. I'm just going to share my screen real quick. It will be my pleasure to speak to you today about what our practice is doing um, to advanced cardiovascular disease prevention. As we do believe that cardiovascular disease prevention is um, the first line uh, intervention that we need to focus on moving forward in um, our patient's care. As mentioned before, I'm a clinical cardiologist for Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute in Miami, uh, a, a substitute of Baptist Health South Florida. Our group is a very large group comprised of 28 clinical cardiologists, six interventional cardiologists, two electrophysiologists, advanced heart failure specialists, two sleep medicine uh, physicians, and numerous um, allied health providers such as APPs and physician's assistants. We have such a large group dedicated to provide excellent medical care to our patients in an integrated uh, approach. Although we spread across numerous um, known subspecialty like clinical cardiology, electrophysiology, interventional cardiology, and structural heart, we have developed more recently other clinical programs that focus um, primarily on patients with comorbid conditions and the treatment of these patients in an integrated type of um, approach. 
We have an advanced heart failure program, cardiometabolic program that was recently developed, hypertension programs, lipid management programs, all dedicated to serve our patients, both in the outpatient setting and inpatient setting to provide the most excellent cardiovascular care. We focus greatly on the need for a prevention and risk reduction center. And um, I'd like to speak to you a little bit about what our team is doing towards that goal. Heart disease is still America's number one killer and leads to significant deaths worldwide, more than cancer and motor vehicle accidents combined. What is heart disease though? As we focus on heart disease, we don't simply refer to coronary artery disease, but focus as well as uh, the pathology of valvular heart disease, cardiomyopathies, which include dilated and uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, pericardial disease, and cardiac arrhythmias. All of heart disease develops uh, early on before even um, before we even see any signs and symptoms from our patients, and we want to try to prevent heart disease in the very uh, beginning of um, life. Unfortunately, U.S. deaths attributed to cardiovascular disease are on the rise. In recent years, we see a significant rise in cardiovascular disease, and that's mostly because of um, the occurrence of other comorbid conditions leading to this issue. This will have a major impact on our healthcare costs and on our patients. We're seeing a close to 200% increase by 2030 in um, chronic comorbid conditions. More than, three, um, more than 83 million will, uh, adults in 2030 will have three or more chronic conditions. And this is important because most of our 30-day readmissions in hospitals are patients um, comprised of patients uh, that have two or more chronic comorbid conditions. By 2060, compared to 2025, chronic disease will continue to increase. Diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and obesity continue to increase uh, as the models predict. And this is very worrisome because these are major risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Important will be identifying our patients at risk. We know the classic risk factors, which include smoking, diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. Pathologically, all these risk factors um, really work at the endothelial level changing uh, our endothelium and um, promoting accelerated atherosclerosis. Smoking leads to coronary vasoconstriction, a hypercoagulable state. And studies have shown that even one cigarette per day can be just as detrimental for cardiovascular disease as um, uh, smoking more than one cigarette. Diabetes as well leads to endothelial dysfunction and vascular smooth muscle dysfunction and accelerated atherosclerosis. The same goes for hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Obesity has a major impact and in the United States, we do have an obesity epidemic. This is also starting to be seen across other countries across the globe. Obesity increases the risk of cardiovascular disease and many other chronic diseases and health conditions. It leads to depression, anxiety, and mental health issues. Also leads to osteoarthritis gallbladder disease, but most of all, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and sleep apnea. Diabetes has a major impact in the United States and worldwide. Amongst U.S. adults diagnosed with diabetes, um, these patients also have the comorbid conditions that I previously described, and most of them are overweight and obese. Cardiometabolic disease and cardiometabolic syndrome encompasses all these comorbid conditions and is a leading cause of premature death wor worldwide. We treat cardiometabolic um, disease and the components of cardiometabolic disease typically in silos. What our center is trying to focus on is to um, have an official program that, that looks at cardiometabolic syndrome and 
uh, tries to treat every single component of cardiometabolic disease in order to provide better patient care to our patients. And studies have shown that this will uh, guarantee a longer median lifespan and many more years incident-free of cardiovascular disease. Unfortunately, our studies have shown that only approximately 70% 7 of patients with type 2 diabetes are in optimal medical therapy and have optimal uh, glycemic control. And this is very worrisome and we need to act and we have the pharmacotherapy to do so. All in all, everything I mentioned will lead to a significant um, cost to our healthcare system. This will impact our nations across the board and also impact our patients significantly. What are some of the tools for primary and secondary prevention? We focused greatly on describing our patient's cardiovascular risk and we use an ASCVD plus cardiovascular risk calculator in, the, in our initial evaluations. We also rely on biomarkers that have been proven to enhance our patient's cardiovascular risk class. To detect cardiovascular disease early on, we'll rely on imaging studies such as coronary artery calcium and coronary CT angiography in select cases. And then as far as treatment, we have to rely on novel pharmacotherapy, which includes um, medication to treat diabetes and hyperlipidemia, some of which I'll talk to you about today. As far as our ASCVD plus risk calculator, this is a very great tool that I encourage everybody to use at any level in their practice if they're trying to focus on somebody's overall cardiovascular risk. It predicts 10-year cardiovascular risk for patients between the ages of 40 and 79 years old and can also provide a lifetime risk for patients that are younger. We can subdivide these patients into low risk, intermediate risk categories, high risk or very high risk uh, categories. The tool uses age, sex, race, blood pressure, cholesterol management, diabetes and smoking history integrated to uh, quantify somebody's cardiovascular risk overall. We can use everybody's risk class to tailor made their medication in order to try to reduce risk and we do so very aggressively. What exactly is coronary artery disease? As defined by the 2021 chest pain guidelines, coronary artery disease um, refers to uh, plaque formation within uh, the lumen of the coronary artery. And any patient with prior anatomical testing, invasive angiography, CT angiography, and even cal coronary calcium scores, we identify those patients that have a positive test as those that have um, coronary artery and coronary ar arthrosclerosis. When um, coronary plaque develops and it obstructs the lumen more than 50%, we start referring to that phenomenon as obstructive coronary artery disease. One of our most important tools in the outpatient setting is the coronary RDA calcium score. We use this tool frequently to elevate or de-escalate our patient's cardiovascular risk class and consider them to have a diagnosis of coronary artery disease if the calcium burden is significant and if the results are clinically relevant. Here we have an image uh, of, of the heart and we can note how calcification just lights up very brightly on, uh, on CT scans and the computer is able to quantify the calcium burden based on these uh, images and uh, tomographic slices. We do have to keep in mind though that the test does have some limitations. Uh, there's two types of uh, arterial calcification. There's medial arterial calcification and there's also atherosclerotic plaque calcification. Medial arterial calcification is the type of um, intimal calcification within the blood vessel that does not lead to any um, coronary stenosis and is not associated with coronary atherosclerosis. This is seen rarely, however, it can occur and we do have to keep that in mind. It occurs more frequently in patients that have chronic kidney disease and advanced diabetes. The more common calcification is noted in atherosclerotic plaque um, and the calcium tends to deposit within the 
at the Roma. And, um, and this is how we identify patients that likely have coronary artery disease. It is important to note, though, that an amount of calcium does not correlate with the severity, severity of angiographical luminal stenosis. To determine luminal stenosis, we would have to pair that with a coronary CT angiogram, which would be a contrast study and used less frequently out in the outpatient setting and very frequently in, in our hospitals within the inpatient setting for chest pain rule-out centers. Also important to note is that there is coronary atherosclerosis and plaque formation that does not have calcification. That type of plaque can sometimes, is sometimes more dangerous and at higher risk of rupture to cause a heart attack. So the, absent, the absolute absence of coronary calcification does not always necessarily mean that the patient does not have plaque buildup. However, it, in in certain models, it has shown very good um, overall preventive prediction. So how do we how do we score the calcium score? A calcium score of zero uh, presumes no identifiable disease. Mild disease is a calcium score uh, less than 100. 100 to 400 um, stipulates moderate disease and greater than 400 severe disease. It is reasonable to look very carefully at patients that have a higher risk, a higher score of 100, um, and also consider those patients uh, with a score that just uh, places them in the 75 percentile or greater compared to their peers as higher risk uh, patients. And at that point, pharmacotherapy with aspirin and high intensity statin starts having a very clear net clinical benefit. Studies have shown that coronary calcium scores of zero are predict excellent survival within 10 years, and uh, those patients have very low event rates as compared to other um, patients that have calcium present on calcium score. Some other biomarkers that we use uh, in quantifying our patients' uh, cardiovascular risk are lipoprotein A. Lipoprotein A and elevated serum lipoprotein A is a risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, peripheral arterial disease, and aortic stenosis. It is a type of li uh, low density lipoprotein, and the values that we look for are values greater than 50 milligrams per deciliter. Those um, typically predict a higher uh, risk and risk of development of CAD. High sensitivity CRP can also be cons considered. However, it is a less specific inflammatory marker. Since it is an inflammatory marker, it can vary in time. Therefore, we have to um, take this information as just another data point um, for defining somebody's cardiovascular risk. Since it varies over time, it is important to consider obtaining two values uh, from the same patient at different times uh, to compare um, and to check if consistently across the board, the, the levels are in the low, average, or high risk values, which I've displayed here on the screen. Moving on to special pharmacotherapy, uh, especially in the case of patients with diabetes and coronary atherosclerosis, we um, we we turn to SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonist. Um, a medication as adjunctive therapy to reduce cardiovascular risk and improve diabetes control. We work together with the primary care providers in optimizing somebody's uh, pharmacotherapy and diabetes control. Uh, with their permission, we add on GLP-1 agonists uh, and SGLT2 inhibitors um, to reduce their cardiovascular risk. And more often than not, these our patients um, are not taking these medications, and studies have shown significant um, reduction in cardiovascular risk. GLP-1 agonists um, significantly help patients uh, lose weight as well, as they um, slow down gastric emptying and provide a very significant um, sensation of fullness where patients are just eating a lot less. 
I tend to use this class uh, a lot in my practice and I've seen excellent results from my patients. The medication is easy to use as it, as it is an injection taken once weekly. And uh, I will um, up titrate uh, GLP-1 agonist approximately once every month uh, to maximum tolerated dose for my patients. I've seen very, very good results in weight loss and glycemic control. SGLT2 inhibitor class, also an excellent class of medication, which we use to decrease atherosclerotic morbidity, uh, mortality in our patients with diabetes. Ecosapentyl ethyl, also known as Vasipa, is an excellent medication that uh, we use as adjunctive therapy in patients that continue to have elevated triglycerides, evidence of coronary atherosclerosis and diabetes. Reducid USA is a trial that uh, looks specifically at uh, US patients and looking at 3,146 um, statin treated patients with qualifying triglyceride levels that were elevated and LDL levels that were uh, fairly controlled. It did show a significant um, um, result in reducing the primary composite endpoint, which were cardiovascular death, non-fatal myocardial infraction, stroke, coronary uh, revascularization, and hospitalization for angina. Moving on in discussing lipid therapy, LDL, LDL control is highly important and we we try to aggressively up titrate statins and other medication to try to obtain an appropriate reduction in LDL cholesterol levels. For guidelines, in general lower risk patients, it is indicated to lower LDL cholesterol levels by 50%, but when we look at our higher risk individuals, we certainly try to lower the cholesterol levels under the threshold of 70 milligrams per deciliter. High intensity statins such as rosuvastatin and atorvastatin are still first line therapy and we use our statins uh, as much as our patients tolerate. However, if we are unable to reach goals, um, we will certainly add on ezetimibe 10 milligrams once daily as adjunctive therapy. We tend to repeat cholesterol levels um, four to six weeks out after starting a new medication to aggressively up titrate and, um, and see the expected results. If our patients do not tolerate either medication or a combination of those two, we will turn to the PCSK9 inhibitor class. And we have some new uh, medications that are very exciting, which are taken uh, less frequently. Uh, anti-lipemic uh, small interfering ribonucleic acid agents that have come on market and are FDA approved, uh, which I, I foresee uh, us using these uh, more in the future once the cost is further reduced um, since it is a new medication and it's quite costly and we're trying to use it in our special uh, patient populations that, um, that qualify for, um, for these medications. PCSK9 inhibitors are also very easy to use as an injectable uh, every two to four weeks. And um, our uh, in Clisaran, Levico new medication is actually uh, used as a single injection once, again at three months, and then uh, it is only used every six months thereafter. So what's exciting about this um, medicine is the fact that it will greatly reduce uh, pill burden and hopefully side effects that patients um, can have with statin therapy and other um, pills that they take. So in conclusion, after talking about um, these measures that our center is striving, is striving to, um, to make, we, we still have to remind ourselves that first and foremost, we want to focus on quality of care. Our programs across the United States are experiencing a lot of pressure both on an institutional level and also from our patients to effectively coordinate the care between patients visits and during our patients visits. We want to take full responsibility of every aspect of patient care, which, which, which refers to even how the patients obtain their medication, uh, how they obtain their medication through insurance and trying to provide all the documentation necessary to get them 
the newest uh, pharmacotherapy available uh, in the market. Uh, we want to manage urgent patients' needs, and um, that is difficult when in such a large practice with such a large patient population. So we'll we'll try to do that uh, within a timely fashion. And of course, we'd like to prevent hospital readmissions, uh, which is most important for our patients and the institutions that take care of our patients. We have a very special opportunity and our team is really trying to take advantage of this opportunity to be a leader, providing team-based care, great patient services, and to coordinate cardiovascular uh, uh, health reduction in South Florida. Uh, we want to improve detection, expand simple access. Uh, we're trying to rely heavily on virtual tools and technology for monitoring, such as remote patient monitoring for blood pressure, weight, and glucose monitoring. We want to reduce medical expenses and also uh, help our patients live a healthy, full life. To do so, we absolutely rely on our team-based approach. We not only use our physicians, but we heavily rely on our APPs, pharmacists, dietitians, nurse navigators in the plan development of our patients. We collaborate um, entirely throughout our practice with all our cardiology subspecialties. As we've seen so much that cardiovascular disease encompasses many uh, issues of the heart, uh, not just one. And uh, we work together with our heart failure specialists, electrophysiologists, and our sleep medicine specialists to uh, provide integrated care for our patients. We strive to do this under one convenient location, hoping to be the number one cardiovascular destination in South Florida and for patients across Latin America. We hope to continue to become an expert cardiovascular team uh, and provide all the necessary um, facilities that our patients need for excellent care. Thank you so much for your time and I welcome any questions. Thank you, Dr. Dervan, for such an insightful presentation and I'm sure the group have some questions for you. Uh, remember that for today's Q&A session, you may ask a question using the Q&A feature located at the bottom center of your screen to the right of the chat feature. Please type your questions there and click submit. So let's go ahead and jump in. Before we do, doctor, I, you know, I thank you for, for an amazing presentation. So much, so much to look at. It was interesting, the comparison, right? From 2025 to 2060, how even though we have all this technology, we have all these medications, we still think things are going to possibly get a little harder, right? When it comes to, uh, cardiovascular care? Yes, the prediction models are very impressive. Um, and um, and that's why we're trying, we're urging our patients to have immediate access to healthcare um, because we learn more and more from every encounter that we have that um, our patients need a lot of guidance. They need a lot of guidance in, um, in nutrition, a lot of guidance in uh, to provide them information on what causes these diseases so that they can take ownership of their own um, health. Uh, and and they're not afraid to ask for that guidance and we welcome any questions, but with a uh, limited time and so many patients to take care of, that is why we need such a large team that can dedicate their time to answer all these questions. Um, so many times I've been asked by patients, well, what should I eat? I just don't understand what's healthy, what's not healthy. And um, I love to have these conversations with them. But um, when I'm limited for time, I love referring them to our nutritionist, which uh, is part of our cardiometabolic program and the risk prevention clinic to have longer conversations. And um, and this is very helpful to them. Do you, I, I mean, I see, I saw the, the total... You know, just like in cancer, you have the total team picture. You, you're doing the same thing with cardiac. Do you see psychology uh, also as a component in the future to assist patients with that? Some folks that have that difficulty with nutrition and, and trying to resolve certain problems that have caused these uh, diabetic situations? Certainly, many of our patients have anxiety issues, depression, uh, we saw that obesity is uh, actually a risk factor for uh, mental health, um, let's call it decline for lack of a better word. 
And um, that is an interesting concept that maybe we should consider um, the psychological aspect and how we can um, we can uh, integrate that within uh, such a center that uh, tries to be um, uh, fully encompassing. So uh, why not? I think that that may be a good idea. And um, and if it helps, um, uh, we'd have to see uh, what the studies show. So a lot of folks that are online today are might be GPs, right? General practitioners. And um, obviously one step before getting to you and then the step after you to maintain whatever to help you, right? And so I guess the question is CT angiogram and calcium scoring, right? When to do one or the other? And it depends on obviously what you have access to. But over here, we really do it by, by symptom management, right? If the patient's having active symptoms, is that is that when you go towards one versus the other? Yes, it, uh, the CT coronary angiogram becomes a specialized test more frequently used in the inpatient setting, our chest pain centers, and for patients with symptoms. Although not class necessarily classical symptoms for cardiovascular uh, or like uh, classical symptoms of angina, but uh, patients that have symptoms that could be consistent with angina. So those intermediate risk patients that we're certainly not sure that they have a high probability of cardiovascular disease. Otherwise, we would just turn to a, a more invasive study like a cardiac cath. So in those patients, we use uh, coronary CT angiograms more frequently. Inpatient, more than outpatient, although I've certainly used it a few times inpatient, uh, excuse me, outpatient as well. Uh, coronary calcium scores, I think, um, is a test that should be more frequently used. And um, I actually am very thankful and excited when I have a patient coming in from a general practitioner that al already has that test available for me to review. Um, as It is a tool that I use frequently in my prevention program. Um, in the cases that I mentioned, um, I, I think that it gives me a quick um, a quick assessment tool to start my work and um, to not delay care. So uh, it can be done very, very easily. Uh, we use uh, we use this very simple payment model for it. Uh, it's an inexpensive test, uh, and we even have uh, some promotions for it during heart month, and we encourage our patients to get it if there's an indication for it. What? Other things as a GP that you would expect us to maybe labs to order prior to the patient getting to you uh, to help you on your next steps. Uh, would it be mainly, uh, you know, normally we do a lipid profile or whatever it is, but what, and then now everybody's talking about subparticles. And, and so it gets complicated, right, for the GP to, to really know which one, but what would be like your optimum referral? like? If, Dr. Rivas would just send you a patient coming in with whatever optimum you would need, obviously, other than the other special things you would ask for later. What would be the optimum one, apart from the calcium scoring? What would be like the labs that you would want to see on your patient? The labs that you mentioned, um, a lipid profile is extremely important. So we'd love to see that um, first and foremost. Uh, a lipoprotein A level can be considered, um, uh, although. We, we don't have medications that truly decrease lipoprotein uh, A levels, and we just use that just as another data point. But, um, but in patients that have, in patients that really have no significant comorbid conditions and are just simply interested in their cardiovascular risk class and want to focus on just the most extreme healthy lifestyle, that can be considered um, as an added test to give, give them a better idea of their cardiovascular risk class. Uh, and it provides just another piece of information. On patients that have comorbid conditions that we've talked about, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, um, a lipid panel is a great way to start. Those patients already have a higher cardiovascular risk. And uh, all the therapies that we, we provide um, paired with imaging studies will be focused on reducing that risk. In those patients, a lipoprotein uh, A level may still provide 
some benefit, however, not as high benefit as those patients that simply just want to be healthy and are interested in long-term um, prevention. Doctor, you came during the, I think right during the thick of it, right? Right in the middle of COVID, uh, right when we were jumping into the, the unknown, right? And and you got in there while the, the, the fire was hot. And <laughs> we learned so much of what we didn't know, right? And, and so can you expand a little bit about, you know, what you all found out later with inflammation and everything that happened, you know, post COVID, uh, maybe patients that did have COVID. What are you finding now in the cardiac side? Something that might worry you on patients post COVID and possibility for these inflammatory things causing worse situations or what, what did you all find? Cause Lord knows you saw a lot of them. I fear that we're still um, seeing the effects and the aftermath of um, the COVID pandemic. And uh, in the years to come, we're just going to discover more and more how this virus will impact the cardiovascular system. Um, the most common um, outpatient uh, um, complaints that I, I get from our patients are those patients that have had a recent infection and due to the inflammatory process that occurs in the body, they will start experiencing uh, atypical chest discomfort, palpitations, and um, sometimes even high blood pressure. Those are the main things through anecdotal experiences that I can I can describe. Um, we we will have seen on the inpatient side a lot of myocarditis, um, pericarditis, um, and um, and uh, we've treated those both inpatient and outpatient. It does tend to resolve in time, and I have not seen significant cardiomyopathies uh, as resulting from the COVID, infect COVID infection in patients, although certainly isolated cases have been described. General inflammation and that sense of chest discomfort, which either comes from pericardial inflammation or sometimes general pleurisy, um, we've treated with anti-inflammatory medication and sometimes uh, added colchicine therapies as a general tool to reduce the inflammatory reaction and give it a time will tell approach if the symptoms go away. Since we're not really with dealing with true angina secondary to coronary atherosclerosis, we're like you said, just treating general inflammation. And I've had good results in patients and it takes months sometimes for their symptoms to go away. I'm really looking forward to seeing, well, I hope the aftermath is not as bad as, as we expect that it could be, but this, um, this virus certainly has um, thrown us uh, for a loop. And hopefully it stays on this version and doesn't come up with a different version later as even worse, right? Let's so, hope so. Um, and, and the, the use of uh, statins, you know, you know, I myself, I had a situation in which I joined the heart study that you that was done here, and I had no idea. I mean, I, I had, a, you know, I had normal cholesterol levels, I had a normal HDL, and here I was with a 25% non-occluding plaque, uh, soft plaque in the left main, and that's how I started my journey with statins, and it was amazing how. Just doing that little change, obviously, you know, I still misbehave. My diet, I still have to fix. But it went down when I did a follow-up CT angio. Uh, it went down to zero. And I'm sure, you, you know, can you talk a little bit about how just doing those little things, how it helps, right? Just taking the medication. I saw one the cardiologist said, what was it? Uh, to next year, 25% of my patients are going to die just because they don't take their medication or something like that. I forgot the statistic, but how important is the taking of the medication? Um, I find that even after my first encounters with my patients, once I give them some evidence um, of the things that we need to work on, uh, that really starts the conversation. So a coronary calcium score uh, may give them proof that there's something that we need to work on. Cardiovascular disease, hypertension, um, all these things, even diabetes until it gets pretty serious, these are silent comorbidities. And without the guidance of a medical care professional, 
uh, our patients don't have the necessary information to truly take matters into their own hands. Nobody likes to take a daily pill or sometimes even twice daily. And that's burdensome. And um, although we, we recommend it, it's hard to do. So once we show them the evidence that there's something to work on and start that conversation, I found that compliance in, um, improves significantly. Furthermore, in follow-up, once we show them that the numbers go down, once they lose weight um, on the medication that, that we start them on, they start feeling better, their blood pressure comes down. We use all these tools to motivate our patients in actually reminding them that if they do become more physically active, if they do take control of their lifestyle and lose a lot of weight, the goal ultimately may be to come off of some other medicine and reduce the pill burden as much as possible. So we, we push our preventive measures very aggressively in the very beginning, but we remind our patients that the goal will be to try to improve their overall lifestyle through these measures and ultimately even come, come off of some of the medications if they don't necessarily need them anymore. So, um, so we, we try to motivate them in that way. Well, the other part that I found so interesting in your, in your resume is the, the, um, the effect that, you know, cardiac imaging, uh, how it's so important in what you were, you, the way you were trained and, and, uh, and again, echocardiography and, and every day something new pops up, right. And, and something new is, is able to be seen. Um, can you, can you give us a little bit about that? You're in the inside of knowing all these things. What is, I mean, what is the next best uh, frontier in whether it's uh, transthoracic uh, or any regular uh, echocardiogram? It will be very exciting to see how the technology and imaging develops. Um, in our practice and at Baptist, we heavily rely on cardiac MRI for various diagnoses. Um, we've used it a lot. Uh, I'm coming back to your question about COVID. We've used it a lot to identify inflammation in myocardial, in the myocardium. Um, and we've used cardiac MRI in serial studies to check for the resolution uh, of inflammation and myocarditis. Echocardiography is still um, a very basic tool that we use. Um, and we will continue using it for a very long time. Um, I think so, I, our protocols will change, and the, as the volumes improve, we're going to have software that uh, identifies, uh, that starts becoming more and more automated. So um, we'll see on that forefront how things go. On the um, ischemic heart disease level as well, and defining coronary atherosclerosis and um, um, luminal stenosis, I think there's going to be exciting developments in the future uh, where we can use um, CT flow and geography. We're going to be able to analyze restricted flow just with coronary uh, CTs and uh, avoid diagnostic catheterizations altogether, which we're still not quite there, but I look forward to times when we're going to be able to really quantify if a lesion is 70% um, and flow limiting or 70% and not flow limiting based on the studies that will be able to quantify flow and the, the restriction of flow. And the fact that you can actually feel confident if you're in a non-cardiac uh, intervention facility, you can actually discharge the patient and uh, and and knowing that you can actually do it without having something happen after, uh, I I find technology is, is so the way in the cardiac side the the, the technology is growing so much that it actually is a great tool. I mean in the in the past what an EKG it, or a stress test is a picture at that time of that moment, uh, and you never know what happens in the next moment, right? And so. All these things that you're talking about are so important of, of, of knowing the next the next thing. And sometimes you can get it done with, uh, with certain technologies that already exist in Latin America and in the Caribbean and other places. Uh, it does not have to be very, very specialized. I'm very excited about the use of remote patient monitoring. 
um, there's new technologies out there that rely on um, continuous glucose monitoring. Um, right now, frequently used for type 1 diabetics, but I believe in the future, we will commonly use um, remote glucose monitoring for type 2 diabetics as well. Uh, blood pressure monitoring in the outpatient setting, which remotely downloads data to our centers, um, weight scales, um, all these things um, will require large prevention centers to, to analyze all the data and keep uh, an, an open level of communication with our patients because it's one thing to acquire all, all, all this data, but somebody needs to look at it and actually intervene appropriately and in due time. And um, uh, that's going to be um, very interesting in the near future of uh, how we do that. Well, Doctor, uh, on behalf of Baptist Health International, I would like to thank you for your very informative presentation. And I would like to thank all of today's participants for your attendance. And if you have any additional questions about today's presentation, please feel free to email them to us at BHI webinars at baptisthealth.net. That's BHI webinars at baptisthealth.net. We look forward to seeing you at our next cardiac and vas vascular lecture series scheduled for May 10th, 2023. Thank you again and had a good, have a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. Thank you so much for your attention. Appreciate it.